let's move on to the next uh, topic we want to talk about. And it kind of leads, of course, they, each one leads into the other, right? We want to talk about, again, this, this is, I think this one is the elephant in the room. Um, because just recently I had my kids, you know, in a camp here in Tobago and this issue came up with somebody, the, the other kids talking to, it was, you know, a non-Muslim, you know, a, a camp for uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, of course. And they were asking my daughters, you know, how do you guys meet someone to get married to if you don't date? There's no free mixing of the sexes. As a matter of fact, Islam doesn't even allow for the man and the woman to touch. As our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, he says the man and the woman, the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu himself never touched a non-family member woman uh, himself. So, and, and because these things invoke a type of sexuality, we could all attest to that. Those of us who grew up in the West, we know that. So if, we, if we're not mixing with the other sex and we're not having that sort of you know, interaction with the opposite sex and gender. Um, how is it that we meet women and how do we meet men, for example? How do we get married and what, how does Islam go about doing that? Is that something that, you know, uh, can you elaborate a bit on it? There's a myth that love is something that arises from, you know, superficiality, you know, just outward appearances and that sort of thing. And that love is something that comes uh, just intuitionally, you know, that you just have a feeling about a person. Yeah, love at first sight. Love at first sight. And the scholars have discussed this in great detail. Ibn Hazm has a book, Tawq al-Hamama. And he, well, this has been talked about in great detail, you know, this notion of romanticism. And it, it does exist. It does exist, right? But to say that all love is like that is a fallacy. As a fallacy, right? And Ibn Hazm himself and Ibn Qayyim in his book, Rawdat al Muhibbin, discusses that in great detail. Um, that, you know, some people are quick to love and they're, they're, they're quick to fall in love and quick to fall out of love. Some people are slow to fall in love, right? but yet they build a family together to the end of it, right? So love has its causes, that there is a natural affinity between people, that there are, there's a shared commonality, that they like the way each other look. And they like the personalities of each other. They like the personalities of each other. This is a very simple recipe. And at the head of the personality is a person's religious beliefs and their attitude towards religion and that sort of thing. So when we look at this general simple recipe of love, right, then as Muslims, we raise our children to be marriageable, to have, you know, to, to care about their appearance to care about the functioning of the house, right? To care about the, uh, you know, the aesthetics of the house and the, you know, you know, for, for men, the ability to earn and provide for family and to have the grit and resilience that's needed to face the challenges that are going to come in adulthood. We prepare, as we talked about, adolescence. And this is at the core of Western society, especially in today's world, you know, that adolescence is focused upon and was really invented you know, around 150 years ago as a concept and adulthood was kind of, you know, went away from and tossed aside, right? You know, to look at how to raise our children to be marriageable and to be prepared for the challenges of adulthood, you know, and to go through, um, to have the skills and the virtues and the values that are necessary to face the hardships of life, you know, that make a family cemented together and give people longevity in their relationship and for people to know the rights of each other you know through the teachings of the religion right these things have been focused on in great detail more than any other religion by, and by far you know beyond what's in any other religion and so you know you find a person outside of that that their sexual relationships are purely transactional they're purely transactional there's no unspoken contract even let alone a written contract between them about the expectations that they have from each other and the rights that are binding upon one another and that sort of thing and for that reason we find the erosion of the family structure and we find that this usually that this has come for generations from the top echelons of society right this non-judgmentalism and that you know you know sow your royal oats and you know go and you know live you know your wildest you know, fantasies, and then, you know, once you reach your late uh, 20s or mid-30s, then settle down with 
you're some poor unsuspecting person who you know who you know didn't know what you went through or has a similar background you know you know who you know doesn't have who's not ready for marriage and not ready for parenthood and so on and so forth and you know we see the effects of this at the bottom echelons of society we see the effects of this in the street culture and the drug culture and the gang culture and all these sorts of things and it's a very selfish way to approach looking at starting a family and starting the next generation and that sort of thing and the effects of that are obvious to anybody who would take the blinders off and take you know the the horse blinders off and their rose-colored glasses and just look at it for what it is.